Hey folks, welcome back. This is the second lecture in the mini course on, on knot theory and four manifolds, uh, but it's really the first lecture of the mini course that's sort of actually about the, the subject of this course. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what that's going to be. And, and to motivate the, the goals of the course, I want to start out by telling you some of uh, five of the questions that for me really motivate a lot of the, the work in four manifold topology. This is not an exhaustive list, but, but these are some of the the key hitters, I think. Um, and all of these problems in their natural habitat are really are really asked about closed four manifolds. So the first three are exotica problems. And the first one is probably what you think of when I say exotica to you. So, so the problem is if I give you some smooth closed four manifold, can you find another smooth closed four manifold, which is homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic to the one we started with? And we know that the answer um, so this is, is yes, sometimes we've been able to produce exotic four manifolds since the work of Friedman and Donaldson in the early 80s. Um, we, have, we have, in fact, a lot of techniques for doing that now. I think um, Andras is going to, to go over some of them in his course. Um, but we're still not very good at answering this question if, if the manifolds you're trying to work with are very simple. Um, for example, this is open if uh, x is definite. Or, for example, if B2 of X, X is uh, strictly less than three. Um, and I, I wanted to make a definition. I, I wanted to tell you that uh, manifolds like this are called exotic manifolds. And I, I suppose you surely know that um, the question of whether S4 is exotic is, is the remaining connection. Okay, so, so that's manifold exotica. Um, it's very famous, but there's two other types of exotica we're interested in that are a little less famous. So the first one is exotica for surfaces. So, so what this asks is if you have a, a smooth closed surface embedded in your manifold, can you find another smooth closed surface, which is isotopic to the first one through topological isotopies, but not through smooth isotopies? So this question is, is or, or objects like these are called exotic surfaces. And just like before, we, we know that exotic surfaces exist. We even know that exotic surfaces exist um, where the surfaces can live in the trivial homology class. But, but just like before, if you wanna ask for particularly simple settings, so very straightforward surfaces, or, or even worse, very straightforward four manifolds, um, this problem gets a lot harder. So for example, this is open in uh, S4. Uh, it's also open in the trivial homology class in, in many other very small four manifolds, but let me not try to state that. Uh, and the third flavor of exotica that, that is sometimes studied is, is exotica for maps. So what this asks is if you're given some diffeomorphism between smooth four manifolds, could you find another diffeomorphism between those same manifolds so that these, these Diffeomorphisms are isotopic through homeos, but not through diffeos. And um, if that's the case, we say that these are exotic diffeomorphisms. And we know that exotic diffeomorphisms exist, but, but as usual, we're not so good at building them on straightforward manifolds. So for example, I think this is open. Um, if x is not a non-trivial connected sum, Okay, uh, so something I try to remind myself like at least once a, once a month or so is that there's, um, there's more to life than exotica. Uh, so I wanted to highlight a couple other types of problems uh, that, that drive a lot of study in four manifold topology. And both of these problems are gonna fall under the general header of, of trying to understand like geometrically or topologically where the algebraic topology of the space comes from. So the first one is a problem you, you've probably seen in some form, maybe in a different dimension in, in your life already. And it's, if I give you some second homology class, what's the smallest genus surface you can find embedded in your manifold that represents that class? <clears throat> uh, in dimension three, this is, this is asking about the Thurston norm. Um, and this is a problem that, that's been studied 
extensively, there are some things we know. We know things like various Tom conjectures, which might say that in a complex or symplectic manifold, complex or symplectic surfaces minimize genus in their homology classes. So, so we have some strong theorems um, that address specific types of problems like this, but in we also have a lot, a lot of cases where, where we can't say very much. So, so let me just write that there are some tools for doing things like this, but, but there's also a lot we don't know. Uh, and the final question I wanted to highlight um, is, is asking sort of where does the pi one of a manifold come from geometrically? So, so let me step back a second and, and set this problem up. Um, we saw in the handle calculus lecture, um, or maybe in Andras's handle calculus lecture, that um, the one handles of a four manifold generate your pi one, right? That's where all your loops come from. You really think of them as one cells. So if you don't have any eight uh, one handles, then you don't have any pi one. And if I give you a manifold conversely that doesn't have any pi one, you, what you might kind of think is like the algebra is not telling you that you should need one handles. And what this question asks is, is that honestly the case? If you have no pi one, does that mean that you can find a handle decomposition of your manifold that doesn't need any one handles? This is um, kind of an absurd question. I don't think this should be true. I don't think anyone thinks it should be true. Um, but, but this question is just completely wide open. Um, maybe let me make a remark about it. If we ask this question a dimension down, um, okay, what are we asking? If we have a simply connected manifold, does it admit it a handle decomposition with no one handle? So in, in dimension three, a handle decomposition is the same thing as a Hagard splitting. So we're asking um, if you're simply connected, does that mean you have a genus zero Hagard splitting? In other words, if you're simply connected, does that mean you're S3? So, so in dimension three, this is the over A conjecture. And in dimension four, we know essentially nothing in the closed setting. So these are all really nice problems, I think, and they're all relatively hard problems, at least in simple settings. Um, and what I want to try to talk a little bit about in, in this course is what happens when you ask these same problems, but in the relative setting, in the case where you're talking about manifolds with boundary. So these are the same problems again, um, but let me go back through them and say what we know in this relative setting and maybe touch them up a little bit if the problem needs a little bit of reworking for this, for this setting. So the manifold exotica problem doesn't need any reworking. You can just ask for homeomorphic but non-diffeomorphic manifolds with boundary. That's fine. Um, and here we know a lot more. We can get exotic manifolds in the simplest case. So, so this is known, for example, for four manifolds that are homotopy equivalent to the two sphere. That's work of Akbalut, Um, back in 91. And in fact, it's even known in algebraically the simplest setting possible. Um, it's also known for manifolds that are homotopy equivalent to a point. And that's work of Akbalut and Ruberman in 2014. <clears throat> so, so there's a sense in which the manifold exotica question is like resolved in the relative case. We can do the simplest thing. What about surface exotica? Um, this is also sort of sort of resolved. At, at least we we can do it in in the simplest possible setting. So this is known to be possible um, even for um, disks embedded in B four, and that's work of Kyle Hayden just last year. Maybe let me remark here, by the way, that I that I might no means giving a, a full history of, of the work on any of these problems, either in the relative or, or closed case. I'm, I'm just highlighting sort of particularly strong results. Okay, what about um, the diffeomorphism exotica question in the relative setting? Oh, sorry, I forgot to let me go back a second. Let me let me touch up the um, the services question. I got ahead of myself. So here, if you're asking uh, for exotic surfaces in the case where your manifold has boundary, then then maybe you want to demand that your surface 
has boundary and maybe you want to demand that this map is proper right. so we're we're asking for for two maps two surfaces properly embedded in our manifold which are uh, isotopic through top a topological isotopy that doesn't move the boundary but not via a smooth isotopy that um doesn't move the boundary Sorry about that. Um, so now moving on to the, the diffeomorphisms exotica question. Um, so here, how might you wanna to touch this up? Maybe you'd wanna demand that um, your two diffeomorphisms, when you restrict them to the boundary, maybe you want that those to be isotopic um, boundary homeomorphisms. And um, I don't have anything to write over here. I'm, I'm not really aware of, of any work on this problem that that specifically makes use of, of the fact that you're working in the, the relative setting. Uh, so maybe that's how you know this slide isn't just full propaganda. Um, and also maybe if you're looking for, for something to, to work on, um, you know, I'm gonna try to show you in this lecture series that when you have boundary, you have a lot more tools. So, so maybe this is something to work on. Um, okay. Uh, moving on, our, our next question was, uh, given a homology class, what's the minimal genus representative? So how do we touch that up for with boundaries? So instead of just, uh, well, for one, I don't just want a homology class. I want a homology class in the homology rel, the boundary of the manifold. And I'm not just going to specify homology class. I'm also going to specify a link in the boundary of our space. And then I'm going to ask that my surface um, be embedded in my space live in that homology class and have the boundary of the surface being the link that I specify. And uh, I'm not going to say anything specific about what's known about this problem. We can by no means answer it for every homology class and link and manifold you might happen to give me, um, but, but we do have more tools. Um, and I'll say more precisely what I mean by that much later in the lecture series. And uh, for the final question about whether no pi one means no one handles, um, this this is just answered. Uh, the answer is, is no. Uh, you can require one handles even though you have no pi one. And this this was done um, for x contractible by Kassen. Um He didn't write it down, so I get to make up a date for this. Let's say in seventy nine. And it was done for X homotopy equivalent to S2 um, just a couple of years ago by Levine and Lipman. So hopefully, I guess what you can see from, from this slide is that these problems are often get a lot easier when you pass to the relative setting when you give yourself a four manifold with boundary that that boundary data ends up being enough additional information that that you can really get started and and what i want to try to do for this course is to develop um, a really easy to use toolbox uh, for solving problems like these And the toolbox that I'm going to um, be setting up, uh, I don't have a good explicit reference to give you that that sets up all of these tools in, in one place. And in fact, um, well, uh, but I think what you should think of as, as being the place where these tools were, were first used and where the seed idea comes from for many of them is um, this paper from Akbalut and Matveyev in 2000. So I'm not gonna be particularly faithful to, um, to that paper in particular, but, but I think it's really the genesis of many of these ideas. Uh, and maybe a more um, sort of literal goal of this course is that I'm, I'm gonna try to take us through proofs in some detail of all of the theorems on this page. Uh, 
And I'm not going to be necessarily particularly accurate to the proofs that were originally given by, by the authors. What I'm going to try to do is give you this cohesive suite of techniques that will let you um, prove proof results of this flavor. And, and we'll spend um, we'll spend some time today uh, going through the proof of this one. Um, but you'll see sort of as we, we get our toolbox set up, these results are gonna almost start getting easier and easier. We'll start being able to click through them. And that that's sort of nice. Uh, everybody likes an easy proof. It's nice if you have a tool that lets you run around and, and smash lots of theorems. But, but I claim is something we should have in mind is that we're not just developing like strong, flexible, easy proofs of these theorems like for our own moral betterment. You know, the reason there's there's a good reason to try to get really powerful proofs of these theorems. And it's because <laughs> these are these are kind of uh, consolation prize theorems, right? We'd really like to be able to work in the case of closed manifolds, and we're working here with boundaries. So, so as we go through the proofs of these, what you should be thinking about is what really powered this proof? How much did I use the boundary? And, and could I eventually redevelop these techniques to work in the closed setting? Okay, so, so let's go. Today we're going to talk about this result. There are exotic four manifolds, homotopy equal up to S2. To set this up, I want to start by making a definition. The definition is of a particularly simple type of four manifold called a not trace. The notation is x of n of k, n and k are the data. And this is actually a manifold you've, you've already seen. They're just a manifold you get by taking the four ball and attaching a single two handle to it with not k and framing n. So, so let's get our, our trusty schematic back up here. These are the manifolds that look like this. You start with the four ball, you pick an odd k in its boundary, and you attach a two handle. So the theorem that we're going to prove today, just a, a more detailed statement of, of what I said on the last slide, is that there exists not k and j such that, um, yeah, this theorem is true for all n, such that the n trace on k is diffeomorphic, sorry, is homeomorphic to the n trace on j but these traces are not diffeomorphic. Uh, and let me let me clarify the statement there. That's you fix an n first, and then you can find a pair of nonce that have this property. Um, a quick comment: not traces. They're a ball with a two cell attached to it algebraically. So so there. Have the home to be type of, of S2 as we wanted. So the structure of the lecture uh, is going to be that I'm going to sketch a proof of this theorem first, just sort of tell you broad strokes, how is this argument going to work? And then once we have those broad strokes, um, I'm going to look at a couple of the ideas that came up in that uh, and say a few words about some, some theory for building exotic manifolds in general. And then I'm going to come back to the proof and start filling it in in detail. So, so how does the proof work? Uh, there's two steps. They're pretty, they're pretty natural steps. The first one is to build, to build yourself these not traces um, and show that they are homeomorphic. Um, give myself more space. And the second step is to show that they are not diffeomorphic. Okay, this is a pretty straightforward outline. So how is the first step gonna go? Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct ourselves knots K and J, such that their traces have the following property. If we start with the trace on K, I can realize this space as cut into two pieces. There's a piece called W and a piece called Z. And Z has a special property, it's contractible. 
And to get our trace back, we have to glue these guys together by some homeomorphism F. Okay, so we can take our trace on K and we can cut off a contractible piece. Um, I also want it to be the case that if I, if I take that contractible piece and throw it away and replace it with some other contractible piece, which we'll call Z prime, I get, well, you know, I get some new manifold, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this up so that this new manifold is my other trace. So let me, let me just state that all again. What we're doing is we're building knots so that I can get from the trace on one of them to the trace on the other by finding some contractible codimension zero submanifold, cutting it off, replacing it with another contractible hunk. Yes, that gets me to my other trace. So I'm going to talk later about how you do this. Um, for now, let's just suppose suppose I can and uh, try to understand how that's going to help me show that my traces are homeomorphic. To see that these traces are homeomorphic, we're going to we're going to appeal to a theorem of Friedman that Aru is going to discuss, and I think in some detail in her course. And what the theorem says is that uh, for any z and z prime contractible four manifolds with a homeomorphism phi from, let's call it delta, delta from the boundary of z to the boundary of z prime. Uh, what he tells you is that there exists a homeomorphism delta across the entire spaces, uh, which does what you wanted on the boundary. So in other words, anytime you have a boundary homeomorphism of contractible manifolds, you can upgrade that to a homeomorphism of the entire space. So how is that gonna help us build a homeomorphism of our knot traces? Well, we have some contractible manifolds in the picture. And what you wanna observe is that we also have a homeomorphism between their boundary, right? It's gonna be F followed by F prime inverse. This is a map from boundary Z to boundary Z prime. So Friedman tells me I can upgrade it to a homeomorphism from Z to Z. Okay, great. So, so what I'm really trying to write down is a homeomorphism of my entire knot traces, and we can do that. Um, let's define phi um, to be the map that takes a point X to uh, itself, if x is in W, and to f of x, if x is in Z. And this just looks like a topological map because f is just a homeomorphism. So this starts to look good. Uh, I have this map. It takes this piece of this one and this piece of this one, but we're not quite ready to say, great, this is a homeomorphism from here to here, because we have to check that this thing is, is actually continuous, right? Like when I smash these pieces together, the points that get stuck together here had better still get stuck together here under this map. So what does that mean a little more precisely? You know, let's suppose I had some point P in, in boundary minus of W. You know, I have some point F inverse of P over here, that's going to get stuck to P under my gluing F. And, and over here, I have some, some other point F prime inverse of P. And, and so what I need, if, if I'm going to get a continuous homeomorphism between these spaces using this, is that I'd better send this map, this point F inverse of P to F prime inverse of P, since they're both going to get smashed to, to P under the gluing and P is not moving. So we want V of Okay, do we have that? 
Well, yes, because what does this homeomorphism F do on the boundary? It does exactly this. So this is satisfied. And we really have written down a homeomorphism from this trace to this one. So I went into a little bit into the weeds here with, with checking that this that this really is continuous across this gluing region, but it, it in fact turns out to be to be very important. We couldn't have just used any old homeomorphism from Z to Z. We really needed to use a homeomorphism that did this on the boundary. And the good news was Friedman told me, you know. I'll work with any boundary homeomorphism you care to give me. So, so we did have that. Cool. So we build a homeomorphism between our not traces. At least we've we've said how that argument is, is gonna work. Step two, we're supposed to now distinguish these not traces. How are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna show that there exists a genus G surface, sigma G, embedded smoothly in Xn of K, let's say, generating H2. And we're going to do this completely explicitly. So this is constructive. And then we're going to show that there does not exist such a surface. Like in the trace of J. And the second line you might recognize as an instance of that fourth problem on the first slide. We're showing that, that there's no surface of a given genus in some homology class of some four manifolds. And we're going to do this using um, maybe an adjunction inequality. or maybe a Hagar floor concordance inverse invariant. And I'll talk more about both of those in the next lecture. All right, so that's, that's how the proof is gonna work. I wanna, I wanna tell you a corollary of the proof um, before we, we start going into it in more detail. <clears throat> and the corollary is that these, Ah, so I've just redrawn down here um, the picture from last slide. And the corollary is about these, oh gosh, these contractible gadgets, Z and Z prime that showed up in our construction. Um, these are sort of interesting objects of their own right. So the corollary is that there exists manifold Z and Z prime contractible, um, which have a homeomorphism between them. But no diffeomorphism between them. At least which which agrees with the homeo on the boundary. And and why is this? Well, you know, if we had a diffeomorphism taking Z to Z prime that did the thing we, we needed on the boundary, then that piecewise function we wrote down, it would have been smooth. The only reason it wasn't smooth was because we used a, just a topological map down here. So um, if we had such a delta smooth, then those traces would be diffeomorphic, which they're not. So, so why am I pointing out this corollary? Um, well, let's look at this statement again. What we're saying is that we have these contractible manifolds, they're homeomorphic, but they're, they're not diffeomorphic at least under an additional hypothesis about what that diffeomorphism has to do on the boundary. So, so this is kind of an exotica statement, and it's an exotica statement for very simple four manifolds for contractible guys. Um, 
<clears throat> so, so this kind of exotica where you make some boundary demands, this has a name. This is called relative exotica. Let me make a couple of, of remarks about RZ and Z prime. Um, it's actually going to turn out, we'll see this by the end of the lecture, that, that the Z and Z prime that we're explicitly using in this construction, they actually are diffeomorphic. So let me say there exists a smooth map from Z to Z prime. And so if you didn't like thinking in this exchange here about cutting off Z and replacing it with a totally different contractible manifold Z prime, what you could have done instead is you could have thought about instead of replacing with Z prime, just replace with, with Z again. And, and how's the replacement going to work? You're going to you know, use this diffeomorphism phi to identify what I was calling Z prime with, with what you'd prefer to call Z. And if you think about this construction in that way, where you're cutting off Z and then you're just gluing Z back in, then, then what you get is that there's this boundary homeomorphism, which is a big composition, sorry. This is a map from the boundary of Z to the boundary of Z. Uh, let's check that. So, so what are we doing? We're going from the boundary of Z along F, along F inverse and then back along phi. Great, that's, that's the right kind of thing. And for exactly the same reason as, as in this proof right here, um, this does not extend to a diffio. So what we got right here as this corollary of, so, so what did we prove in, or what will we prove in the theorem? It's that there are exotic full stop, no reference of any kind of boundary homeomorphism, they're exotic homotopy S2s. What we're getting as a corollary is that there are contractible manifolds, which are exotic. They're not diffeomorphic to each other, at least given some particular boundary data. And in fact, we're even getting a stronger corollary. We're getting the fact that, that there's a contractible manifold, which is, is relatively exotic to it to itself. We have this boundary homeomorphism from Z to Z, which doesn't extend. <clears throat> so I think when you first see relative exotica, maybe it, it looks like a, a curiosity. And, and then maybe it also looks like kind of second class exotica. It's, it's 1991. We're not ready to prove that there are sort of honestly, absolutely exotic contractible manifolds yet, but, but we can prove sort of this version. Um, but in fact, relative exotica is a really important thing in the general theory of exotic four manifolds. To, to tell you why, uh, let me make a definition, but this definition is just words for the objects we saw on the last page. So a quark um, is a pair of contractible manifolds, Z and Z prime, such that you have some boundary homeomorphism between them. Um, <clears throat> and there is no diffeomorphism between them, which does, which, which restricted to the boundary gives the given homeomorphism. A second part to the definition, if, if one of the pieces of your, if one of your manifolds from your quark embeds in, in some four manifold W, and you build a manifold W prime by cutting out your Z and re Z prime using your boundary homeomorphism, then we say that W prime came from W by quark hosting. Okay, so, so that's just exactly what we did in the proof. <clears throat> What's the theorem? Uh, so this theorem, uh, it has a bit of a complicated history. I'm not going to state it. Um, there's, a, there's a Kirby survey paper on this theorem, which will tell you sort of exactly who proved what and, and when. Um, let me just tell you what the theorem is. The theorem is that cork twisting is, is a completely ubiquitous way to build exotica. So, so slightly more precisely, um, 
for any pair of four manifolds W, which is homeomorphic to W prime, um, I want to demand that these manifolds are simply connected. And I also want to demand that their boundary is either empty or an integer homology sphere. Uh, then W is related to W prime by quark twister. So in other words, if you have if you have any two homeomorphic manifolds, then what's the difference between them? It's really just kind of contained in some contractible codimension zero submanifold, because you can cut off that codimension zero thing and replace it and get to the other manifold. Let me make a remark about. Oh, a couple of remarks about this, this definition and theorem. Um, the first is that most authors are going to take the definition of quark to be a little more restrictive than what I've done here. Um, the theorem is stronger than what I've stated here. It's true for the more restrictive definition. But because we're going to be building a lot of things with quarks, I want my definition of, of quark to be kind of as general as possible. So, so let me stay here. Um, a second comment is that you know, cooked into the definition of quark is that this is a relative exotic pair. I am I'm demanding that this boundary homeomorphism uh, does not extend smoothly. <clears throat> so, so I demand exotica in my definition of quark, but I want to point out that there's no exotica. You don't necessarily get exotica when you do quark twisting. Right, W prime may well be diffeomorphic to W. You won't be able to write down like a piecewise diffeomorphism taking one quark to the other to get from here to here. Um, but maybe there's some other diffeomorphism available. Um, so before I leave um, the statement of this theorem, I, I want to make I want to ask a couple of questions about it. Uh, and I want to ask them of, of you or other people. So, so a question you, you should be asking Aru is, um, why is the quark theorem true? Um, I don't think she's going to completely prove this, but, but she should give you some idea why, why you should expect uh, topological manifolds to be related by, by chopping something off and replacing it. Um, so for Andrash, um, Andrash is going to give you, at some point in his course, constructions for building pairs of homeomorphic manifolds. And uh, they're not going to look like this. So what you should ask him is, um, you know, where is the quark? And what this theorem is telling me is that anything Andrash is doing to build homeomorphic manifolds could have been done uh, with a quark. So, so where is it? How do you relate the constructions? Um, an open question is, is the following. Um, do there exist W and W prime homeomorphic four manifolds, um, which let's say very vaguely require a complicated quark? Uh, what's the spirit of this question? If you have a pair of, of non-diffeomorphic manifolds, you might want to, to put some kind of metric on, on how non-diffeomorphic are they. And, and since you know they're related by quark twisting in some way, you, you could use quark twisting to try to define a metric like that. You could try to say, well, they're really different if you, if you have to use a really complicated quark to get from one to the other. That's what this question is getting at. Uh, if you make this question precise, I, I think you'll find that it's a reasonably difficult one. Uh, and maybe the final question I want to ask, which, which is maybe a little more tractable, is um, can you prove other quark theorems? So can you prove a quark theorem for, for example, other pi 1? Um, pi 1 z would be a really compelling case. And can you prove a quark theorem for other boundary? Um, 
I'm not aware of, of theorems like this in the literature. Uh, I think one runs into some technical difficulties. It'd be nice to have, be nice to have them. Okay, so um, before we return to proving that there are exotic homotopy S2s, um, I, want to, I want to have a look at um, an explicit example quark, because so far the only contractible four manifold we know of is the four ball. Um, and the four ball only has the one boundary homeomorphism. That's due to serif, and um, well, it, it extends. So the four ball is not a quark. So let's find, let's meet a quark. Um, Here it is. So we're finally half an hour in making use of the fact that we are all newly minted handle calculators and we actually know how to explicitly write down pictures of four manifolds. So here we go, here is one. This is a four manifold, we're gonna call it Z. It's got one one handle using that dotted circle notation and one two handle. And this is gonna turn out to be a quark. <clears throat> so the first thing we should check about it is that it's contractible. So how do we think about the algebraic topology of this object? Well, the, the pi one is generated by that one handle. So you know, we sort of have a generator of pi one that maybe looks something like this. And then we get relators from our two handles. And, and what you should notice is that this two handle here, it's it's homotopic to the red curve, right? Because you know there's this clasp, but via homotopy, you could just undo this. So the blue curve is homotopic to the red curve. So we get a relator killing our pi one. Very good. And um, I'll let you check that the homology groups of this space are also trivial. Okay, cool. So this is contractible. Um, I need another contractible manifold such that I can find some, some homeomorphism between the boundary of this guy and the other guy. And to do that, I want to recall this kind of accident of handle calculus that I mentioned right at the end of last lecture, which is that the boundary manifold, it can't tell whether you stuck a two handle along an unknot or whether you carved out a disk along an unknot. So what that allows is this really cute um, trickery, which is that it's pretty easy to find another manifold that has the same boundary as our Z. What you do is you just swap the dot and the zero, right? This blue curve here, it looks kind of complicated in the picture, I suppose, but, but actually it's three crossings non-alternating. There aren't any interesting knots like that. So this is an unknot and this is an unknot. So, so the boundary, well, for one, it's, it's just a legal, this is a legal handle that, oh gosh, it's a gone handle diagram. It's a legal handle diagram of a four manifold because we're dotting an unknot. Um, and the boundary of these manifolds is actually just like bang on the exact same Dane surgery description. So, Boundary of Z. That's the same as boundary Z. Okay, so we'll be in good shape as long as Z prime is itself contractible. Um, to understand the algebraic topology of, of Z prime, well, what I'd really like to do is understand the one handle. And right now, the one handle is isotoped into a pretty funny position. I can't really like see the the kind of shadow disk for it, so it's hard for me to see what is running over the one handle. So, um, so what you, what I like to do when I'm presented with a handle diagram where my one handle looks funny is make it stop looking funny. So, so we're gonna isotope this diagram. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to prove this now, but you can isotope this diagram around to look like this. Okay, and now my one handle looks normal. I can tell that the black curve is running over it sort of exactly as the, the blue curve did before. 
Um, so for exactly the same reason as before, uh, I can check that pi one of Z prime is also trivial and, and the homology groups of Z prime are also trivial. So actually maybe something you're noticing here is that uh, it was really the exact same reason as before. This handle diagram is, is bang on the same as this one. And, and what that tells us is that there's a diffeomorphism here. Right, the diffeomorphism is, is just identify by not moving anything, these two handle diagrams. So what we're observing is, is this fact that, that I mentioned was, was gonna happen, which is that Z is honestly diffeomorphic by phi to Z prime. And let me just emphasize that, that that's not a problem. This thing can still be a quark, even though Z and Z prime are themselves diffeomorphic, because you know, a quark is, it's not just two contractible guys, it's two contractible guys and a particular boundary homeomorphism. And the boundary homeomorphism we're using is this boundary homeomorphism in here. Oops, that's not right boundary. Which observes that these two diagrams give the same surgery diagram of the boundary. So I haven't, I haven't proven that that, that boundary homeomorphism um, doesn't extend smoothly yet. Um, all I'm observing is that this boundary homeomorphism here is not necessarily the same boundary homeomorphism where you identify these two boundaries and then undergo the homeomorphism given by this isotopy. So the fact that there's a diffeomorphism here doesn't like kill us dead and make it so that this couldn't possibly be a quark. Okay, so armed with this quark, we're actually prepared to prove, prove the theorem in detail. So we're gonna build knots whose traces are homeomorphic and not diffeomorphic. And to do that, um, we're gonna start by defining a pair of manifolds X and X prime um, as follows. So let me steal this picture. Okay, so my manifolds are gotten from Z and Z prime by just attaching a single additional two handle. And <clears throat> by building X and X prime in this way, it's supposed to be relatively clear that X is indeed homeomorphic to X prime. How do you get from X to X prime? Well, what is X? It's just our quark Z with a two handle stuck on top of it. So I can take off Z and glue Z prime on by this boundary homeomorphism, which has the effect of just swapping the dot and the zero. And what, what do I get when I do that? I get X prime. And since Friedman tells me this exchange, there's a homeomorphism performing it, then these manifolds are homeomorphic. Okay. So, so with very little effort, just armed with sort of the existence of, um, of contractible manifolds with the same boundary, we've built um, some more interesting homeomorphic manifolds. And what's more interesting about them? Well, they're homotopy S2s, right? Because this was contractible and we stuck a single two cell to it. <clears throat> so what do we need to show to, to finish proving the theorem? We need to show that X and X prime are both not traces. And whatever traces they turn out to be, I'm gonna define that to be K and J. Then we are gonna show that there exists a torus embedded smoothly in X prime generating H2. And then we're gonna show that there does not exist such a torus in X. 
And then we'll have proven the theorem and we'll have proven its corollary, which is that these two contractible guys are relatively exotic using this, this homeomorphism. So this is honestly a quark. Let me prove two uh, just right now. So we're gonna try to spot uh, an interesting torus embedded in, in here in X prime. And as before, you know, I don't find this picture of X prime particularly easy to work with because the one handle looks funny and I really only know how to think about one handles when they're straightened out. So let me isotope this picture of X prime <clears throat> in the same way we isotoped our picture of Z prime above. Um, and I just want you to notice that, you know, this additional two handle here, it could really be shrunk so that it was just like a little bead on the black curve. So, so we can do the same isotope we did up here and, and what will happen to um, our two handle, the green one is that it'll go, you know, maybe somewhere like that. <clears throat> okay, cool. So, so what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find a torus in here generating H2. And remember, we're thinking about H2 as being generated by this green two handle. So I want to find a torus that runs once, at least algebraically, over this two handle. So, so to find that, let me let me start off by drawing you a, a kind of schematic picture of uh, X prime. So as usual, our schematic, let's make it a little bigger, starts with the four ball. And then what do we do? We have a one handle. So we're thinking about that as being removing a disk blue. And then we have a black two handle. And the black two handle runs over the one handle. So let me kind of in our schematic denote that like this. It's, it's feet are over there interacting with the one handle. And then we have a green two handle. And the green two handle it interacts with the black two handle, but it does not interact with the one handle. So maybe in our schematic, I'll draw it over here. Okay, so now I'm trying to find a torus in this manifold that runs once over the green handle. What's the attaching sphere of the green handle? It's the trefoil. And you know that the trefoil bounds a genus one surface in S3. And so in particular, by taking that genus one ciphered surface in S3 and just pushing it into the four ball a little bit, leave the boundary in S3, just push in the interior, what we see is that there's a genus one surface with one boundary component here. And let me emphasize, there's a reason that, that I bothered to, to say that this green handle is very far away from the one handle. And it's because you know if the green handle in fact, ran over the one handle, then, then when I tried to take that, that ciphered surface, you know, you might see me drawing something oops, like, like this, where the ciphered surface kind of tried to use space that has actually been carved out of our four ball, and that would be, um, that would be not legitimate. So um, it was important here that, that I checked that the green handle was like completely split from the blue handle in order to, to find this pushed in ciphered surface. But since it is, I can find that, that pushed in ciphered surface, and then I can cap it off with the core disk in the handle. And there we go. That's a T2 in X prime generating homology. Cool. So that's step two. Two more to go. Let's do step one. So I'm supposed to prove that X and X prime are both not traces. Um, what we have on this slide is just the pictures of X and X prime from before. So let's start with X. We want to show this is a not trace. What's a not trace? That's just the four ball with one two handle stuck to it. Our picture of X is more complicated than that. Than that. And um, we learned in the first lecture exactly one move for simplifying a handle decomposition. And it was a canceling one two pair. So that's what we're going to try to do. And when you look at this diagram of X, you see a canceling one two pair, right? A two handle cancels the one handle if it runs over it geometrically once, which is exactly how this green guy runs over this black one handle. So we can cancel these guys. Um, we just have to think for a second before we do it, what's supposed to happen to the blue? 
when we do that cancellation. So remember, you know, when we talked about cancellation, I was like, pinch the canceling two handle and, and use it to topple the one handle. Well, maybe you remember that anything else that was trying to run over the one handle, what should happen to it is it, it has to kind of fall down onto the canceling two handle in some way. But thinking through that, um, you can do it. Um, but sometimes when I'm doing handle calculus, I like to not use my brain. So, so let me show you a trick for uh, not having to think all the way through that. Um, <clears throat> the trick is to use an, our other handle move, which is two handle slide. So you know that I'm allowed to slide this blue two handle over this green one if I want to. And let's suppose I want to do it right here. Um, let me, I'm not going to completely draw this, but let me start to draw what would happen if I, if I did that. And what we would see is that blue would sort of turn around right here and, and start following along the green. We'd see something like this. And if you look locally at what's going on with the blue right here, it's, it's turning around and, and running right back off the one handle. So this, this blue curve is no longer running essentially over the one handle where it did. So by doing a slide like this, we've reduced the number of times that the blue two handle runs over the one handle. And that's sort of good news if we like to cancel the green and black without having to think too hard. If, if nothing else runs over the black one handle, then we'd just be able to, to delete black and green from our diagram. So in order to perform this cancellation, the way I often like to think about this in practice is what I'll first do is I'll slide blue over green a whole bunch of times, three times, so that blue no longer runs over the one handle, and then I'll just erase black and green. And when you do that, uh, you get something which you're going to work out as an exercise. And I do want to encourage you to um, to at least get started on doing this if you haven't worked with handle diagrams before. And um, this is a good this is a good place to make sure you understand like what does zero really mean here? What do these slides look like? Okay, so we, we can't see what um, what very complicated blue two handle you're going to get at the end of this exercise, but certainly you're just going to get one blue two handle. So whatever you get will be a not trace. Cool. So that was X. What about X prime? Here's our, our favorite handle diagram of X prime. And again, we'd really love to cancel something against the one handle, um, but it doesn't look great. I don't have anything that runs geometrically once over this one handle. Like the, the black two handle, it's really, it's really stuck on itself by this clasp right here. So, so this is not a canceling one too far. Uh, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna apply a trick that I think originally comes from that Akvalute Montfeuf paper. And the trick says, look, Maybe the trick comes from an earlier blue paper, I don't remember. The trick says, look, this clasp, this is your problem. If this weren't here, black and blue would be a canceling one-two pair. I'd like to get rid of this clasp. Now, what do I have? I have this green two-handle, and this green two-handle is clasped on this black strand, just like this is. So I'm going to try to use a slide to get rid of this clasp. And here's how the slide's going to go. It's going to go like this. So let me actually perform this slide. I'm going to try to get through this lecture series with very little live handle calculus, but here I find it might actually be, be worthwhile. The new framing is plus or minus two. I didn't work it out in advance. Okay, so this is what we get when we do the slide. <clears throat> and that just looks like <laughs> worse than what we had before. Um, but let me, let me try to clean it up. Right, so right here, I see a Reitermeister two move. So let's get rid of that.
Okay, and then I notice that if I start right here on my black curve and I go for a walk that away, I walk along until I get here. And on that walk, I only went under other parts of my diagram. So it's a valid isotopy to swing that black strand anywhere I want, as long as I only go under. So for example, I can swing that black strand out to here. Okay, so now we're looking at um, something. It still looks pretty bad, uh, but let's step back for a minute and squint a bit so you only see the black and the blue curves here. And when we're just looking at the black and the blue curves, you should start to feel good. You should see a canceling one, two pair, right? This like big black arm, it's kind of a mess, but it's not stuck on the black anymore. There's no crossings. So we could isotope this away. This would become a canceling one, two pair, and then we could cancel them. And the process of doing that uh, gets a little messy. You are again um, invited to carry it out as an exercise. But at the very least, we, we can already see here that whatever we're gonna get, um, it's gonna be just some complicated green two handle. So it's gonna be some not trace. So what about step three? Uh, the final thing I'm supposed to do is show that there is no torus in X generating homology. And we are going to do that explicitly, but we're going to do it next time. Uh, I want to take a little, a little time and care to, to set up these instructions. So that'll be the starting subject of the next lecture. Um, great. I'm looking very much forward to um, meeting y'all in the office hours um, Monday and having the next lectures be um, somewhat more live. I, I hope I'll see you there. I hope you um, ask questions. Until then, take care.